Hello everyone, it's Lindsay, and today I'm back with another Bible journaling process and study, mini study for you guys, as I continue to work through the Living Stones devotional kit from Open Journey. Um, this is the series that I have been doing for several months now. I know it's been kind of hit or miss the last few weeks. Um, my health has just been kind of crummy, uh, and so I've been dealing with that. I'm doing some new um, shots and treatments, and so it's just taken me a little bit to get adjusted to that, um, but I did want to continue Continue working through this. Now there is a new devotional release from Open Journey. Um, born, be born into my heart, be born in my heart, be born in my heart. Uh, it is for the Advent Christmas season. I will have a detailed unboxing for that coming out very soon, um, but I will have that kit linked down below as well if you want to um, jump in and grab that uh, for that season. But for now, we're continuing through Living Stones, and we are on section seven, uh, titled A Stumbling Block. And so Ingrid has several scripture for us, of course. She's really good about that. And so we're going to look at kind of two different aspects. So, uh, us ourselves as Christian not being a stumbling block to other Christians, and then also uh, some scripture that talks about Jesus being a stumbling block. And so we're going to look at what that means uh, and kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, now, she does have like a little mini word study for us within this devotional day. And so rather than doing like a study video and a word study video, I think there will just be the one this week. Um, there isn't a card for stumbling block in the set, um, but you could obviously create your own card um, and do that for yourself if you wanted to, but I'm just going to do kind of a quick kind of glance over of that word within the study today. So like past studies, what I'm going to do is go through each one of the verses that she has for us. And then I like to take in um, a variety of different commentary, uh, men, by biblical scholars, much, much more educated about the Bible than I am, and kind of share what I found as I was studying that. I do have a few of my own notes, and we're going to tie in to some previous uh, studies as well. And that's kind of one nice thing about working through a longer study like this is there's a lot of, you know, sh I don't know, referring back to past days in the study. Uh, and so I'll try to link those videos down below if one of those pops up and, you know, ties in with that. So starting with Matthew 16, 23. Now this is going to tie in with that passage that we looked at where we looked at the foundation of the church. There was some conversation that we had. Uh, I shared my beliefs about Peter being the foundation of the church and that scripture and whether that's referring to that. Uh, and then there was some good, um, commentary in the comments of that video. So I'm going to put a card here, link that down below. And so this passage in Matthew 16, 23 comes right after that conversation in Matthew 16, 16 through 18. Uh, it says, but he turned and said to Peter, this is Jesus. He turns to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but men's. And so just before this, um, Peter is, you know, basically declaring that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Messiah. Um, but then he starts to have a little bit of uh, doubts and he's kind of concerned, you know, in, in this whole conversation with Jesus, he's telling him that, you know, Jesus basically is telling them that he's going to be crucified for um, believers. And so Peter has a little bit of a moment of like, well, are you sure? Do you want to go in there? Like you're going to get some hostility. Uh, and so, uh, Jesus is telling him, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to me for you're not setting your mind on God's purposes, but men's. And so David Guzik says that this was a strong rebuke from Jesus, yet entirely appropriate. Though a moment before Peter spoke as a messenger of God, this is when he was declaring the truth of who Jesus was. He then spoke as a messenger of Satan. Jesus knew there was a satanic purpose in discouraging him from his ministry on the cross, and Jesus would not allow that purpose to succeed. Uh, John MacArthur says that Jesus' death was part of God's sovereign plan. We see that in Acts 2.23 uh, and then also Acts 4.27-28. Uh, the Lord was pleased to crush him in Isaiah 53.10. Uh, Christ had come with the express purpose of dying as an atonement for sin, John 12.27. And those who would thwart his mission were doing Satan's work. So God wasn't pleased by Christ's suffering, the actual you know suffering that he experienced, but he was pleased by our reconciliation with God through Jesus. That whole process is what was pleasing to him, not the suffering that was pleasing. But um, this was planned from the beginning of time. Um, before there was time, this was planned that this is how this was going to go. David Guzik says that Jesus exposed how Peter came into this satanic way of thinking. Uh, 
He didn't make a deliberate choice to reject God and embrace Satan. He simply let his mind settle on the things of men instead of the things of God, and Satan took advantage of it. Uh, Peter is a perfect example of how a sincere heart coupled with man's thinking can often lead to disaster. And so uh, he wasn't focused on that, um, you know, salvation and reconciling humanity with God. He was focused on worldly uh, suffering and relationships and those kind of things. And that distraction allowed, you know, Satan to get in there and put doubt. And uh, he was, you know, used as a tool to kind of, you know, stir up doubt in that situation. And, you know, Jesus recognized, uh, no, thank you, Satan. I don't need you, um, you know, trying to dissuade me from doing this. This is what needs to be done. So looking at the word or the words stumbling block uh, in the Greek, this is Strong's Concordance number G4625. It's a scandalon, which may sound like scandal. Um, they say that's probably a derivative from the word that is found in G2578. So you can do um, a study in that. Uh, basically, this is uh, the stumbling block, scandalon, a scandal is a trap stick or a bent sna uh, sapling. For example, a snare, figuratively, cause of displeasure or sin, um, occasion to fall, of stumbling, offense, thing that offends, stumbling block. So a snare, a trap, don't be a trap. Don't be a, so a scandal is a trap. Uh, so really interesting, uh, you know, when you look at the word in the original language there, a stumbling block, you don't necessarily think of a stumbling block as a snare or a trap or, you know, something like that. And so very, very interesting there. Uh, going on to Matthew 18, 7 says, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person through whom the stumbling block Comes. So now we're going to be looking at uh, Christians as stumbling blocks. John MacArthur says it is expected that those in the world will cause Christians, I should say Christians and non-Christians. He's going to look at both of this, but John MacArthur says it is expected that those in the world will cause Christians to be offended, stumble, and sin, and they will be judged for it. But it should not be that fellow believers lead others into sin, directly or indirectly. One would be better off dead. And the cross references for that are Romans 14, 13, uh, Looks like 14, 19, 14, 21, 15, 2, and then 1 Corinthians 8, 13. And so we can expect that non-believers and those of the world are going to be stumbling blocks for us. They're going to try to tempt us into sin behavior, but we also don't want to be that for other Christians. And this is where we can kind of start talking about um, convictions versus commandments. Uh, David Guzik says, this teaches us that we can... Uh, let go of the anger and the bitterness for what people have done against us. God promised to deal with those by whom the offense comes. So going back to this passage in Matthew 18, 7, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person through whom the stumbling block comes. So God is going to judge those. If there is somebody, you know, specifically when we're talking about non-believers, if we are getting frustrated with non-believers living out their sin lives, uh, recently I said the statement, you know, heathens are going to heave. Uh, we can get caught up and focused on that and frustrated by that. And it may lead us to sin behavior in our own anger and how we respond to that. Um, but it's important to remember that God is going to judge all. He's going to judge believers, non-believers. Um, our judgment is going to be a little bit different than non-believers judgment. We are not going to be cast into the lake of fire. But we're still going to be held accountable for, um, you know, the things that we did and didn't do even as believers. But when it comes to non-believers um, being stumbling blocks and calling us into sin and, and their activities and the behaviors they're doing, um, they're going to stand before a holy God, a holy God that hates sin. And they are going to have to answer for that. And their punishment is going to be an eternity in hell. And so, um, you know, important to remember that, that he is the ultimate judge. We are not. And so uh, hopefully that kind of helps helps us as we try to, I mean, I know it's hard to ignore or dismiss, but maybe a little bit easier to turn away um, from that behavior, those things that, you know, are trying to be done to us, um, be more forgiving and knowing that, you know, in the end, God's going to deal with it. 
Uh, so Romans 14, 13 says, therefore, let's not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's or sister's way. So this is looking specifically at uh, Christians here in Romans. Uh, John MacArthur, in reference to the stumbling block, he says, anything a believer does, even though scripture may permit it, that causes another to fall into sin. So don't pass judgment on other Christians for their convictions. Uh, I found a quote that says, believers cannot wield their own convictions like a club browbeating others into conforming with their preferences. I know we are in the holiday season and the internet is a buzz with Christians um, battling out the opinions about celebrating certain holidays or how we celebrate uh, and that kind of thing. And so this is where we get into, you know, not browbeating each other. Now we can guide each other in love. Um, we can, you know, take steps to try to point, you know, to scripture that's led us to our convictions, but ultimately the Holy Spirit is who's going to convict you. And so uh, an example of this, uh, as far as the scripture in Romans 14, 13, that I could think of would be, you know, alcohol, consumption of alcohol. The Bible is pretty clear that we are not to drink to the point of drunkenness, but it does not say to just cut out all alcohol out of your life. Uh, we saw Jesus turn water into wine. There's multiple references to wine throughout the Bible, um, but becoming drunk is a sin. Now, if you are somebody who is a Christian who is quite capable of having a glass or two of wine and not getting drunk, and that is a conviction that you are comfortable with, then that's great. But if you are having a friend over who is a recovering alcoholic, you probably don't want to serve wine at your table. Uh, you don't want to cause them to fall into temptation to sin and to lead into drunken behavior. And so that is kind of a real world apical way I could kind of look at Romans 14, 13. I'm sure you guys can think of some others as well. Um, but again, not beating each other over the head with our convictions, but also being respectful of other people that may not be convicted of the same things that we are convicted of. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says, but take care that this freedom of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Again, very similar to what we just talked about. Um, David Guzik says that we might stumble or cause our brother to fall in two ways. We can discourage or beat them down through our legalism against them, or we can do it by enticing them to sin through an unwise use of our liberty. So we don't want to sin through legal legalism and we don't want to sin through an unwise use of our liberty. And so it can go both ways. And I understand that there is defense for both the whole, you know, grace, 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 free in Christ. We can do whatever, whenever, however. Um, and then, no, there's a rule book that gives us instructions for our lives. You can go to extremes on both ends of that. And I think that there is kind of a middle ground and it really comes down to your relationship with God, what the Holy Spirit is doing in your own life and convicting you of, um, and your personal relationship. And then we can come alongside each other and kind of be bumper rails, uh, kind of guiding each other to, you know, what scripture says. Um, and again, all with love with understanding, with grace, you know, all these things. Again, we do not want to browbeat or beat somebody over the head um, with our uh, convictions. So jumping down, I'm going to kind of twist and look at um, Jesus being the stumbling block. So same word here. Uh, Luke 7, 23 says, and blessed is anyone who does not take offense at me. Now that's the NASB translation. So you don't see stumbling block in there, but um, in other translations, it would read and blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And um, this is Jesus talking. So David Guzik says that Jesus knew that the focus of his ministry was offensive to the expectation of the Jewish people. He was going against everything that they believed and knew they lived by the law. Um, and he's coming in and rewriting things, telling them, you know, the law was just there to show you how ineffective the law is and how desperately you need a savior. Um, it says, who longed for political different de deliverance from Roman denomination, um, Roman domination. But there was a blessing for those who were not offended because of the Messiah who came against the expectation of the people. So to, to not be offended by Jesus. And I think we can kind of think about this too. There's a lot of people who, you know, don't say, claim that they don't want to be followers of Christ because they don't want to change their life. They don't want the rules. Um, but it's, it's not living out the rules for the sake of our salvation and that that's what saves us is living out the rules in thankfulness because we've been saved. And so not being offended by Jesus, you know, kind of upending everything. First Peter 2, 8 says, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this, they were also appointed. John MacArthur, um, 
this is, he's saying that this is quoted from Isaiah 8, 14. Uh, to every human being, Christ is either the means of salvation if they believe or the means of judgment if they reject the gospel. He's like a stone in the road that causes a traveler to fall. So you were either going to fall to the side that is the way that leads you to salvation, or you're going to fall to the side that is the way that leads to eternity in hell. There's no, there's no third option. Jesus is, Jesus is there. He is the rock in the middle of the road. So either you are going to accept him as your savior, um, and go down that path, or you are going to reject him and go down that path. That's it. Those are the only two options. Uh, let's see, a uh, cross-reference for this in 1 Peter 2, 8 is Matthew 21, 44. It says, and the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces and on whomever it falls, it will crush him. So whether you fall on the concrete, you're gonna be broken or whether the concrete falls on you, you're gonna be broken. Christ is a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over to unbelievers. And the prophet Daniel pictured him as a great stone cut out of the mountain without hands, which falls in the kingdoms of the world and crushes them. You see this in Daniel 2, 44 through 34, 44 through 45. Um, we'll look at this section again, uh, this passage in section 10 of the devotional. Um, whether a ceramic vessel falls on a rock or the rock falls on the vessel, the result is the same. The saying suggests that both enmity and apathy are wrong responses to Christ and those guilty of either are in danger of judgment. Again, only two options. He is um, he is the ultimate judge. So where are you gonna where are you gonna fall on that? Romans 9, 33, and this is the passage that I will be journaling in today, says, just as it is written, behold, I am laying a Zion, laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and the one who believes in him will not be sh will not be put to shame. Obviously, I have been battling a migraine for like a week and my uh, speech is not working with me. Uh, this is uh, coming from Isaiah. Uh, we can look at 814 and 28 through uh, 2816 in Isaiah. Uh, long before his coming, the Old Testament prophets had predicted that Israel would reject her Messiah, illustrating again that her unbelief is perfectly consistent with scripture. So there are Jews today who still stand and believe that Jesus is not the Messiah. And this is the Old Testament prophesying this very thing that's going to happen. It's saying that, you know, Messiah is going to come and there are going to be people who don't believe he is the Messiah, um, but they are still going to be judged regardless of that. So looking at a stumbling block, a scandal, a snare, a trap, uh, occasion to fall of stumbling and offense. So whether we are, you know, whether the world is being a stumbling block for us, causing us to sin, whether we are being a stumbling block to other Christians, leading them to sin behavior th through an inappropriate exercising of our um, liberties in Christ, or whether Jesus being looked at as the stumbling block, well, whether you are going to believe in him or not, he is, he's in the, he's in the center of the road. You got to pick a side. Um, and that is all there is to that. So there's just a quick look at the study, um, not as eloquent and well put together as I usually do. Like I said, we're struggling to get through this. So assembling block section seven, moving along to the Bible journaling process, um, kind of we're nearing the end of some of the supplies in the kit. I'm kind of having to get creative um, with what I have. Um, as far as like die cuts and stuff go. But again, I am working in Romans chapter nine, verse 33. Behold, I'm laying in Zion, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So uh, of course I've got some dyed ledger paper as my background. Uh, I have this hymnal paper. I have Jehovah is my light. Um, you know, I choose for Jesus to be my path, the rock that I stand on, not the rock that crushes me. I recognize him as my savior and, you know, I live my life in that way. And so I thought this was a good uh, hymn to pick for that. We are going to age this a little bit. Uh, and then I'm going to create a tag to put our title on. And the title is going to be a rock of offense. Um, and I have these journaling cards from Tim Holtz and the large ones perfectly fit for the Tim Holtz tags. So it's like an instant background. You don't have to do much to it. And then this was, like I said, I was running out of die cuts. So this was one of the like uh, two inch pieces in the kit and it had this rock on there and I just fussy cut it out and made it into a, uh, you know, ephemera piece. And then I'm 
need some flowers. I feel like there needs to be some flowers. So I'm going to pull out the stamp set, one of my favorites from Open Journey, and stamp and cut out some flowers from the other half of this with that fun textured background. Show you, you know, you don't have to have a whole bunch of texture paste and inks and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can create with these panels that are included in the devotional kits. And if you need additional ones, you can get the digital um, format as well and have additional printables to work with. So of course, we'll add a few other things on there, embellishments and things. But let me go ahead and put you guys on fast forward and we'll put together this entry uh, for Living Stones. All right, so nothing different from the last, what, six videos. I'm starting out by using some matte gel medium to glue down that dyed ledger paper. Again, if you've missed how I created these, I do have a shorts video that I created over here um, that I will link down below showing how I did these dyed papers. They are just awesome for creating instant backgrounds with lots of color and texture and just make it really easy. And by gluing this down with matte gel medium, I'm essentially, you know, prepping the page as well. So I don't have to worry about bleed through. So I went ahead and made sure that was good and dry, trimmed off all the excess, and then now I'm going in with some brushed corduroy Distress ink and a blending tool and just inking up the edges. Uh, it's kind of nice because when you have some texture on there, like you can see on the by my left hand, uh, it kind of grabs a hold of that and adds even more interest. If you want and um, you know not as dark, just use a makeup brush instead of that blending tool to blend the ink. But I want to add a little bit more to this background, of course, when do I not? So I pulled out this stone stencil from Tim Holtz and some regular opaque white texture paste. And I'm just putting a thin layer of this through the stencil. This does not stay perfectly white like this, especially with the dyed papers. The papers were dyed using Distress Ink reinkers, and so those are water reactive. They're not permanent. And so as this dries, it's going to pull up the color a little bit and it's going to tint this paste. You can lessen that by using your heat tool to dry the paste. But this time around, I let it air dry, which I don't ever hardly do. But I had a terrible migraine by the time I reached this point. So this is actually the next day. I let it just dry overnight on its own. And you can see it's kind of um, more muted and has picked up some of the background uh, color. But that's okay. I'm going to go in and kind of intensify this texture using some Distress watercolor pencils. These are a new product from Ranger and Tim Holtz. They are a water reactive like pencil essentially. Um, and I'm just using a wet brush. This is a water brush and hickory smoke pencil and just picking up some color and dabbing it around. Uh, you can experiment with using stains or inks or paints. They're all going to give you different effects for this technique. Um, and the Texture paste will grab a hold of different mediums differently. So um, this one left it, you know, darker in between those stones and lighter on top of the stones, which is what I was wanting. And then now I'm going in with one of the uh, like verse stamps from Open Journey and just stamping that as a texture using some archival ink. And then I'm also going to go in and splatter some black soot distress spray stain. So just adding lots and lots of texture and interest to the background. A lot of this gets covered up with those papers, but it just adds some fun little interest in the background. So I've moved aside my Bible. I pulled out my silicone mat. I'm still trying to decide how I feel about this thing. <laughs> have a love-hate relationship with it, but I've sprayed down some old paper, antique linen, and um, Victorian velvet distress spray stains, added lots and lots of water, water to this hymnal paper, and then I'm dipping it in that ink. Now, in hindsight, this still was pretty dark, even though I added a lot of water. Um, and what I found was that it leaked through to the back of the hymnal paper, and it, but it was very light. So if you want a light application of these spray stains, dip the back side because then that is what will bleed through to the front side and it'll be a lot lighter. But either way, it worked out fine. Uh, and now I'm just going in and just distressing it some more, tearing some edges, adding some more of that brush corduroy distress uh, ink. This time I'm using a makeup brush and you'll see it gives a, li a lot lighter of an application of the ink, a lot more diffused, softer, and it's a little bit easier to apply this um, with a brush on more delicate paper like this hymnal paper. So I made sure it was good and dry and then now I'm kind of wrinkling it up just to add more texture to it. Just being very, very careful as I flatten it back out um, and as I wrinkle it. 
So moving along to the next element, I've pulled out one of these uh, tags from Ranger and the hole reinforcers are really easy to just pull up uh, away from the tag. And I hold on to that because I will reapply it after I've added this paper. And again, the paper I'm adding is one of the journal cards from Tim Holtz. And they are just perfectly sized for these tags. You just have a little bit to trim off there and uh, just get, you know, instant background. So rather than using like a dyed ledger paper or something like that, this has already got um, interest on it. Of course, I do go in and distress it a little bit more here in a second, but I'm using a hole punch to re-punch that hole. And then you'll see here I can reapply that hole reinforcer. Sometimes the glue on it is still intact and you can just use that, but I pulled it away and just use a liquid adhesive to adhere that down. And this is where I'm going to stamp my title phrase, uh, the rock of offense. So I'm using a mixture of these stamps. These are from Felicity Jane. Sadly, Felicity Jane is going out of business. I don't think these ones are available any longer, um, but I will try to find something comparable to link down below. And then these are the tattered alphas, distressed alphas, something like that from uh, Tim Holtz for those larger letters. So continuing to create all of my different elements here before we assemble everything, I'm using those floral stamps, stamping them on that little remnant of a uh, piece of cardstock from the kit. Really, I'm trying to get the most bang for my buck out of that, <laughs> out of that kit with every little scrap of paper and pieces um, that I have in there. And so this is just a fun way to create your own ephemera using the stamps. I am using some archival ink to stamp these because the cardstock that Ingrid uses in her kits is really nice quality, is slightly coated. Um, and so it's a little bit slippery, not terribly, but um, I found that it's a little bit easier to stamp on it with the archival ink. So I went ahead and fussy cut out all those flowers. I have that rock piece that I had cut out from that uh, large cardstock piece earlier. And then now I'm just kind of figuring out how I want things layered. Um, just, you know, repositioning things. I usually cut this out. You don't really ever see this part, but I'm letting you see kind of my brain and work here. I needed a little bit more contrast. Everything was kind of similar tones. So I pulled out that doily. I only need half of it because the rest of it will be underneath the tag. Um, but now I'm going in and distressing the tag, like I mentioned, with some more brushed corduroy ink. And you can see much more heavy handed when you use the blending tool. And one little trick here I have is to bend corners and ink them up. And that just gives you even more uh, interest and texture. I'm just kind of wanting to do things to help it stand out because the layers are kind of, you know, especially that hymnal paper is very close in colors to the background. Um, and so I'm just trying to do some things to help all the different elements stand out from each other so you can see them individually while still being all kind of cohesive. This ribbon was part of the packaging from the kit. There was like a corally pink one um, and then this seafoam green piece. Don't throw away anything. I save every little bit of these kits, uh, especially when you're doing multiple entries like I am doing with this kit. Um, you know, you need just about every little bit to create these multi-dimensional pages like this. And so yes, most of that hymnal is covered up, but I'm okay with that. I was just using it more as a layering element. Everything has been glued down now on the left-hand side, and then I'm using some of the faux washi from the kit, tearing it apart, um, and just kind of using a chunk of it to indicate that uh, scripture that we are journaling. I will also uh, highlight it with a brush marker as well, um, but I like using these just to kind of pull some of that color and texture over onto the right-hand side as well. So here's a look on the back side. You can see that little mark there is actually ink that just kind of got underneath there. It didn't bleed through. That was an oops, but um, you can see nothing bled through. There is a finished look at the entry for today. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave those down below. Check out the description box for links to everything that I mentioned and used. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. And until next time, thank you so much. Bye-bye.